Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Heartstopper Season 1, Episode 4, Secret. In this episode, this is probably, I shouldn't tell you this. But this is the first episode of Heartstopper that I haven't watched twice because this hurt. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Elin for commissioning this episode. Elin, I know that you're not here probably because of the uh, time difference again. I also, I didn't realize it, but Elin's, I think, Anya's, if I'm saying it correctly. And I did not realize that y'all were the same person because I lose track of usernames on Discord. So, uh, hi, Anya's. I didn't think I had seen you for a while, but turns out you've been around. So, you guys, this episode is such a sad, oh, this one was so, and I should have known this was coming because it's the fourth out of the eight episodes. So you start to hit a crescendo here of like, we've got to have the the real stakes and drama happening. But I wasn't, I'm not used to such short seasons, like eight episodes is it's becoming more the norm with like streaming exclusive shows like Apple TV. I think the first season of Ted Lasso, it was either eight or 10 and after party was eight episodes. And, um, something else that I've been covering was eight as well, but I, I keep forgetting there's only eight for this show. And so I wasn't like thinking about the natural arc that has to happen for the plot and everything has been, moving forward so beautifully this whole time that I let myself just kind of accept that forward movement was all we were going to get. And of course that can't be how it is. Then there's no story, you know, like you have to have some kind of obstacle. So we have this obstacle because of a few factors. (sighs) You guys, Let's just go ahead and get this out of the way right now. Tao. Bruh. He is really pushing my buttons. He has made me disappointed. I want so much And I know, I know that he is going to come around based on the tone of the show. And I know that to a degree, the antipathy he has toward Nick and his friends is completely earned by them. Like they are not making any, (laughs) they're not making any argument for themselves in this episode. They are acting like complete goons and Nick is not standing up to them. So this is what I'm sort of understanding about Nick's character at this point. He is strong enough to consider, I think I have a crush on this guy. He is self-aware enough to ask the internet, am I gay? He is willing to try out kissing and not completely panic or clam up or pull away. He manages to like get over those sorts of obstacles pretty quickly. And that's wonderful. And that's super necessary to being a good person. But where Nick is really struggling is he doesn't want unpleasantness. That's the, that's the impression I get. It's not even necessarily that Nick is a coward. That's such a strong word. And like, I don't feel like all fear is the same type of fear, but 
understandably, one, Nick has heard how homophobic his friends can be and is now potentially going to be on the receiving end of that. So if you're worried that you're going to be coming out to your friends sometime soon and you already are going to be like dealing with that bullshit from them, you don't want to add on top of it that you have been like confrontational lately and a pain in the ass lately. You want to like figure out a way if you can to do it so that they like don't think of you as difficult. And this is something I have to imagine that you're, if, if you're from any marginalized group and you are primarily going to be surrounded by people who are not of that group, you struggle with how to advocate for yourself without like becoming the not a team player guy, you know, because that's exactly the language that's always used. If you're not willing to like let yourself be demeaned or taken advantage of, you're not a team player. So, and he's like literally on a team, like, you know, so he's got this whole thing going on with that. And then also like second to just the bullying thing, you just really get the impression that Nick gets along with everybody because he is not a drama type guy. And I think there's something we have understandably a tendency to use the word like drama in a deeply negative and often kind of misogynistic way. And there are times where to a point I understand this, especially like when we live in a world now where so much is done for the camera, so much is done for the clout on a post on Facebook or Instagram. The concept of people who like start drama, we have a connotation with that, that is growing much more prevalent because you can literally be making a profit off it now. So I, I really do get where that comes from this feeling of just like, ew, gross. But the issue with that is sometimes you calling a person out and not like letting them get away with it, you get assigned the person who's bringing drama when the person who said the shitty thing is actually bringing the drama. The only reason you get blamed for it is because you were supposed to just go along with it to not rock the boat and you didn't. And since you're not going to turn a blind eye to it the way you were supposed to do, well, now you're an issue because everybody else was just going to let it slide. But if you like back it up a little and really look at what happened, the person starting the drama was the shithead who made the bigoted comment, actually. So what we've got in at the end of, you know, the last episode was Nick like saying, I guess I was just in a mood and walking away from his friends, clearly not wanting to be friends with them anymore, but not knowing how to handle what the fuck was going on. And for a second, I had really respected him just being like, that's homophobic. And you know what? I'll like you. Happy fucking birthday. And he walks away. I'm like, wow, King owned it. But then he like immediately walks it back because this is about to be a little bit more about him than he, than it was before. Like what it comes down to is some shit happened, you know? So this episode, we really get to see a lot of him not calling his friends out, not stepping up, not wanting to rock the boat. And there comes a point where it's like, dude, even if you weren't gay, even if that wasn't going to be an issue for you, you really should be saying something just because you are supposedly friends with the dude whose friends these are. And it, it, it's like, you know, take the relationship factor even out of it. So it's just you guys, I, I just want to get this out of the way because it just was so, so difficult. We have 
a scene where Isaac and Tao are having lunch outside and they are talking about how Charlie never eats with them lately because he keeps going into the art room and having lunch with Nick. Um, and at this point, they're in the midst of this with, you know, Tao getting himself sort of worked up with he's putting himself in danger. I can't believe he's like befriending one of them. And there's a, a real sense in the midst of this of like, oh my God, can you calm it down, Tao? It's not that serious. When all of a sudden, here comes fucking Harry throwing a rugby ball in his face. Like literally, it's at his head while he is unawares and unprepared. So, you know, I'm in the middle of just being like, oh my God, will you chill? And then like, he's immediately proven a little right. It's not like he's, this isn't coming from nowhere, his feelings towards this group. I, and I knew that, you know, but there is something different about seeing it this way and how completely unwarranted all of it is. I never thought he deserved it, but sometimes you can grow like this dislike for people simply out of contempt, bitch eating crackers syndrome, where you're just like, I don't like that person and everything they do is shit. Even though none of it was necessarily directed at you, you've just decided fuck them. But here you get to see like, it's explicitly directed at him 100%. So there's no defending that. So, you know, like I said, it's Harry who chucks it at him. And I'm just like, God damn it, because he's such a, he, the look he gives his friends as he is about to throw it, he's so proud of himself. Like the, the, this is just the thing about dudes who posture like this is how fucking funny they think they are. And there was a, a, a Facebook memory that came up for me today about how so many men out there when they take these positions of like, you know, a sexist or racist narrative, how they think they are saying something really edgy and new. And I'm going to read some of this because I pulled the tweet up just so that I could read it to you guys, because this is Harry all over. Um, <laughs> Men are mostly unchallenged on their belief that they are unique geniuses one reason it's so difficult for men to believe in systemic discrimination against people like them is nobody shows them how dull they are. And this is all from at MC underscore Hecken underscore Duff, D-U-F-F. Give me a man who thinks he's, quote, sticking it to the SJW oppressors, and I'll show you someone entirely interchangeable with 10,000 other men. I mean, without any friction, switch them out mid-conversation. And never spot the joins level. They're that generic. The we're combating the PC oppression myth is entirely self-serving because everyone knows defending the status quo is uncool. So people basically invent a fake oppression where other people are asking to be treated like human beings and it's ruined their lives. Men create this persona around their entirely generic, entirely boring reactionary politics that lets them cosplay being rebels. Every woman alive could have written that Google Bronifesto from the brief quote, imagine what every sexist dullard you work, work with would write. Just like your witty DM slide is actually just one more wave in a never ending ocean of mediocre cock crashing on the beach of a woman's day. So your disruptive rebellion against the tyranny of SJWs is utterly mundane and uncreative. They are the wallpaper of our lives. They are everywhere. They are completely inescapable. They are totally ubiquitous and generic. Look, that's a manifesto in my opinion. I love that with all my heart. And the main reason is because of how absolutely devastating I would feel if anybody ever called me generic. <laughs> so that's my thing. But like, that's Harry. That's Harry. He does this. He's like 
Look at how clever I'm about to be. I'm going to chuck this rugby ball at a guy's head who doesn't know it's coming so that it'll hit him in the head. This is what you got, Harry? It's fascinating. It's really interesting. So original. Very good. Wow. Oh, my God. Get a life. And these guys behind him. <laughs> what are you fucking? There's nothing. It's not even like. It's so pitiful. It's so, so pitiful. It's it's like <clears throat> there that ground is barren. No seeds will grow. So anyway, he chucks it at fucking Tao. You can see how Isaac tenses up when he sees this. It's clear like Isaac hasn't been really in agreement with Tao. So there's almost for me like Isaac's in the same boat as us. Where he's just kind of gone, God damn it. You know, I was hoping that I could just like let him rant and it wouldn't be a whole thing. But so Tao picks up the ball and the boys who have just continued to walk on, they are left behind when Nick turns around and comes back to them and says, can I have the ball? And Tao holds it out and Harry goes, or sorry, uh, Nick goes to grab it. And Tao pulls it away as the crowd goes, whoa. And Tao says, no, it's mine now. And Nick doesn't know what to do. He doesn't want to start a thing. He's very uncomfortable. I think, you know, he knows these are, are Charlie's friends. So I don't think he wants to start shit. So he starts to walk away. And when his back is turned to Tao, Tao throws the ball at his head. And it's very clear. You could look at this scene from the outside without knowing what's really going on as simply Tao taking out his frustration at being bullied by that crowd, taking it out on a member of that crowd at random. But we know he especially is so angry at Nick. And so that attack was like very purposeful and very personal in a way that it wouldn't you wouldn't know if you weren't aware of the entire situation. So I swear to God, you guys, that was so, I just like that. I hated that moment so much, both because of how Tao behaved. Cause it really was very childish, but also he's just been bullied. And like, for why nothing, he's literally just sitting there. And I was also so frustrated because Nick doesn't stand up to his friends or just be like, guys, what the fuck? Why'd you do that? He doesn't, even apologize on their behalf to Tao, which he could have done, but that's too close to reprimanding them directly. And I was very disappointed in that. So this is when we go to like the, you know what? I'm not going to jump over there. I just wanted to talk about Tao off the top and we'll back up and pick up right where we left off because the last episode ended with Nick standing outside Charlie's house in the pouring rain. And it starts exactly there, which I didn't expect. I thought we would cut to him like inside the front door at the very least. I figured we wouldn't jump too far ahead, but it's, he's literally still just standing there. And he says, I'm sorry for not texting you. I wanted to talk in person, which I, one uh, on the one hand deeply appreciate and because this is an in-person kind of conversation but also i wholeheartedly understand why charlie took the no texting as an extremely bad sign so charlie reaches out and drags him in and is like did you forget to wear a coat and he says uh i forgot i didn't check the weather before i left and he starts to be like can we talk about what happened because the, the I just wanted to say, and they get interrupted by Charlie's mom. Oh, worst timing ever. And she is here to tell Charlie to get dressed because he is heading to his grandmother's. So he isn't going to be around. And I was sort of hoping that they would be able to like hang out for the day, but apparently not. Um, and they retire to the bedroom. I was very glad though, because this talk on the front step with the door open, it was not the place. Yeah. 
take this inside, guys. Go somewhere private. Like, come on. Um, I love Charlie checking his hair in the mirror. But but even if it's not good, there's nothing you can do. You've got curly hair. I've got news for you. Unless that bitch is sopping wet, it's not getting rearranged. No how. <laughs> it's not happening. Um, so Nick comes in. Fucking takes his hoodie off in this in this fucking gesture, you guys, where he's like his abs, like the shirt underneath the hoodie gets caught and pulled up. And I was just like, now, Nick, that's really mean spirited. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. Um, Oh, no, I'm seeing people in the chat saying they're having an issue with the sound and stuff. I'm sorry. That sucks. And it's Cindy, of course, that this is happening to. I'm sorry, Cindy. I, uh, it's looking fine on my end. If I get glitches, like that'll happen, but it's not happening this time. So apologies. Every, like everybody else is saying theirs is okay. So I don't know. Um, but okay. Okay. So I gotta, I gotta go back though. So this, this is so, so painful. It's so painful. So Nick is standing there and he's like clearly trying to think how to say what he needs to say. And Charlie is standing there looking at his feet, won't even make eye contact. And it took me a second to like, I was like, why, why does he look like that? And then he blurts out, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. And he looks like he's going to cry. And I was like, oh. No, he is not going to apologize for kissing him. Like, it didn't even occur to me that he was going to, like, take this tack with it. I don't know why it didn't occur to me, because, of course, he didn't get any response from Nick. Like, of course, he thinks that Nick regrets doing this. So, of course, this is what he he's going to. But I didn't even think about it, you guys. So when he starts out with an apology, I was... Oh my God, I was so heartbroken. I was so devastated. I, I, and his acting here, he is so pitiful and sad and it's awful. I'm, it was, I didn't think properly about what I was doing. I did a stupid thing. I don't want you to feel awkward about it. It was all my fault. I shouldn't have kissed you. I, I, I bet you just felt pressured to do it because I asked and you probably don't want to talk to me again. And, but I at least had to say sorry if there's any chance that we can still be friends, I don't want to lose you because I did something stupid. And Nick keeps trying to get him to stop and keeps stepping forward and he keeps talking. And finally Nick just grabs him by the side of the head on each side and says, Charlie. And he takes a minute and thinks about it. And then he kisses him again. And you guys, it's just a really good kiss. Like these two, they both look like they are very good kissers. They really do. There's just like, they just do. I'm just saying. And it's very obvious Charlie was not expecting that. And he just like, doesn't know what to say. And it's just just like, uh, (laughs) and Nick backs off and just says, God, I'm so sorry. I, I, I'm having a full on gay crisis. And I was like, oh my God, I love that he said that. I'm so sorry for running away last night. I was just freaking out. I was confused and surprised and yeah, I'm having a full on proper gay crisis. And it's not that I didn't want to, but I was just confused, you know? And I loved this. I really loved it. It, His acting here is like so vulnerable and so genuine, you know, and he is scared. It's totally understandable. And he says to Charlie, I think I just need some time to figure this out. And we get a moment that I just loved where Charlie puts his arm around his shoulders and I, you guys, I thought he was going to look at him and be like, 
I'm going to kiss you again. But instead, Nick just puts his head on Charlie's soldier, shoulder and starts crying. And it's a pure, like, intimate, supportive moment without being romantic. It's still romantic. Don't get me wrong. It explicitly is romantic. But it was so sweet for them to be able to, like, be like this, this kind of vulnerable. And there's no sense of like weirdness to it. You know, I just, I just love this moment. I loved it so much. So then we cut to, um, the two of them in the anteroom again. And he says at school, is it okay if we're like, and Charlie says, keep this a secret. And Nick nods, but you could see the shame on him. It's the, the, I don't think Charlie means for this to sound like what it sounds like. I think Charlie, when he says, keep this a secret with that tone, I think what he means by that tone is obviously like, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. I've been through this before, but I think what Nick hears is sure. I've been through this before. You know what I mean? And, and don't get me wrong. Um, I think there is a corner of Charlie's mind that also feels that way. He has been used by somebody who just wanted to experiment, but did not care about him as a person. And it is natural to be concerned that is happening again. He has developed much more of a real relationship with Nick. They hang out. They are publicly friends. They go to each other's homes. Their mothers know their faces. It's different than it was with Ben. But that could easily change depending on the way that this all goes down, you know? So there was a big part of me that was like, I, I, I really understood Nick feeling the shame, even though I felt like I got what the vibe really was with Charlie. He's trying to be understanding, even though it's frustrating. You know, he wants to be out. He like cares about this guy and just wants to be able to be together. And now we got to deal with this drama about it, you know? So he hands Nick a umbrella Nick goes out and Charlie watches him go for a second. And then he puts on his shoes and runs after him and kisses him under the umbrella in the middle of the street, which I thought was like, considering he just said, keep it secret, kissing him in public felt like not that Charlie, but also it was very romantic. So, you know, what, what, what can I say about that? Um, so we go then to school the next day. <sighs> this is the worst. You guys, I was all, almost about to be all up in the discord and I was like, it's not Thursday. It's Tuesday. I'm going to record in on this in one more day. Just chill. But I'll tell you what, guys, you know, I'm going to watch the next episode like right after this. And I'm going to be in the discord talking about it like as soon as I'm done, as soon as I can. I have to make dinner and stuff. But and also if Owen's around, I guess I can't. But I had to just keep it inside. So you guys, Imogen, I really, I'm not blaming Imogen. Okay. I just want to make that clear. Imogen has done nothing wrong. She's a little cringe, especially when we see the scene with her and Tara. Oh my God. But she's not a bad person. She's not doing anything wrong. It's not her fault and I can't hate her. But I want to hate her a lot. Because she's ruining everything. And it, again, it's not her fault. She doesn't, like, she doesn't see. But I just, like, 
I kind of hate her a little and like in a way that's very regretful. Like I'm ashamed of it. But can you please just disappear, Imogen? Oh my God, I'm sorry. Go, leave. I cannot, babe. I just cannot. <sighs> so this scene, she immediately like sees Nick. Something's different. And you can see him just be like, wait, what? And it, it, the whole, she's, she's taking the moment to flirt with him, touch his hair. I can tell when something's changed, you look different. And she goes in and like really messes it up. I love when she says, don't worry, I'm a qualified hairstylist. And he says, qualified from where? And she says, the University of Hairstylists. <laughs> um, but this, so she says, I've, I've got to go. I forgot I had morning detention. And I was kind of like, what's, why? I wanted him to ask. But he's like l looking at his hands when she walks away. And smiling to himself. And we know what he's really smiling about. But she turns around and sees him smiling like that and, like, thinks it's about her. I'm pretty sure that's what she's thinking. So it's just, like, it's so, it's so difficult, you guys. And later in the episode, like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to talk about it. I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to talk about Imogen all at once. Later in the episode, she asks Nick out. I was about to say Charlie. I'm sorry. I need to address this. Nick looks like a Charlie and Charlie looks like a Nick. Am I wrong? Their names do not go with their faces. Each of them looks like their characters should be named the opposite thing. And I cannot, I keep having to stop myself and mentally switch every time I say one of their names because I instinctively want to call the ruddy, russet-haired boy, I guess he's not russet, what would you call that? Burnt umber hair boy, Charlie. That he just, and then the sprightly elfin one, Nick. Like, of course, with the dark hair. Like, it just, I don't know if that's just me, but I really, it's, I don't know why it's so burned into my head. They just don't feel like they match. But anyway, she asks Nick out in front of everybody and it's a really it's a really weird setup that I think these are moments where I can feel that this is based on something because it doesn't seem natural to me everybody has like gathered around to watch her ask Nick out and she chooses to do it this way and I can't imagine any girl that's in high school who's wanting to ask out a guy being surrounded by the football team and not asking that guy to like go off somewhere a little bit more private for a second. I like her just deciding that she's going to go through with it, with asking him right there in front of everybody felt bizarre to me. I don't get it. But anyway, I do respect it. I'm like, Oh my God. Cindy is saying Imogen isn't in the comics. So this bit isn't actually based on anything. Well, then I don't fucking know. I was, I would have bet anything. And I feel like you guys did tell me Imogen wasn't in this, which surprises me. So they added her just to have somebody like to redirect with. Do you like that better, Cindy? Like just out of curiosity in, in regard to the chain. Cause you know, sometimes and we don't like to talk about it a lot, but sometimes TV can improve the original thing. It, not like in general, but there are some storylines, for example, in the uh, Game of Thrones television show that I actually preferred what they did to what was in the original text. It was few and far between, but it happened. So certain changes, I was kind of like, wait, this isn't, oh, well, I guess it's fine. Um, and... Emily says, I like where she ends up. Cindy says, I do like it. It adds a little conflict that I appreciate. I adore Imogen. She reminds me of myself when I was in school. Yeah, I, I think that's part of what makes me so like hesitant to 
say anything about like super negative because I get, I get her, you know, I really have a lot of sympathy for her. Um, that's my book. Dion says there's a theory about Imogen presenting comfet and that he or she is performing what is expected of her comp comp hit. Um, Oh yeah. Emily says next episode is, and Cindy's saying no spoilers, please. Yeah. If you guys, Emily, uh, just to warn you, cause you said this time, I like where she ends up. And last time you said something about how Tao is way better in the second season. Don't give me any sort of like heads up like that. I understand the impulse because you're not saying anything explicit, but it is implied spoilers and it can really like skew how much grace I'm willing to give a character if I'm warned that they are going to be forgiven or, you know what I mean? Like, so just, it's just completely leave out your opinion on how things go and only talk about what is happening here. Just, it's the safest way, but I get it because I, really have trouble sometimes as the unspoiled one guys when i start hunger games with rashawn it's gonna be a challenge <laughs> um oh compet is compulsory heterosexuality <gasps> i never heard that i love that oh my god I really like felt that in my heart, not in a, like, I think that applies to me way exactly because this is just me, but Ooh, I love it. Interesting. So she's just performing what is expected of her. So maybe she doesn't even really like Nick that much, but is, or see, see, no, wait, he is Nick. Oh God. I got it right that time. But you know, She's like, I've known you a long time. There's like friendliness between us. I'm supposed to have a boyfriend and I'll ask you. Like, I really get that, actually. I don't know if that's what's happening with her, but I like that theory. And I like this, like, I never, what would you call compet? Like, just portmanteau? Is that, does that apply when it's, I assume. But yeah, I've never heard that. And uh, what an interesting it's almost like, but not exactly the same as a pick me. A pick me is different where you are performing a role for men explicitly for their gaze, for their approval. And compet is like similar, except it's all of society. Um, but same sort of idea of like really living by the pressure of other people's gazes and not your desires, which is tragic, frankly. Um, so that moment where she asks him, like I, I said at the, like, before I got sidetracked, sorry guys, um, that I really like the, the fucking guts it takes her to, she's asking him in front of everybody, like a part of me cannot help but respect that because I would never Ever. Like, not unless I was absolutely certain it was a sure thing. And even then. And so I kind of like that. I like this in, if I'm looking at it solely as she's got guts, but I don't know that that's all that's motivating her to do it this way. That's the, the thing that's really bugging me is we have all heard of the trap that a lot of men will lay when they think they're losing a woman they decide they want to hang on to her and they want to propose but they're not sure what answer they're going to get so they decide to propose in front of a crowd so that the woman will feel really obligated to say yes because she doesn't want to be the bad guy in front of a bunch of people and humiliate him i'm really really worried that she only did it this way to make sure he had to say yes. And I hate that. I hope that's not her motivation. I hope that it's just pure guts, but I'm worried that it's not just that. So, all right, going to go back though, because we haven't gotten to where we're going yet. Um, we see Charlie heading in to the art room where Nick is waiting 
to have lunch with him. Oh, well, first we have homeroom, actually. I forgot about that. And the, the, the way they glow at each other, you guys, I can't handle it at all. Uh, then we jump over to Elle and she's like keeping an eye on Tara as Darcy comes in and the two of them sit next to each other as they always do. But Tara's like giving Darcy a bit of a look, glances over at Elle and then it's just like, you know what? And she gives her a good morning kiss and Darcy's like, oh, well, okay. And Elle says, is this how it's going to be now? Am I officially the third wheel? And Darcy says, we're finally taking the opportunity to kiss as much as possible. And honestly, there was a part of me that was sort of like, I would be the same way. Like if I had, if I was super into my significant other and I was like not allowed to have PDA with them. And then all of a sudden I was allowed to forget it. It would, I would be so insufferable. You would not want to be around me. Um, so yeah, Elle though, even as much as she says, like, am I the third wheel now? I think that she seems happy. Like the way that she looks, I w was worried for a second that we were going to get a real sense of like, oh my God, I am the third wheel. Oh no. But no, it feels to me like she's glad for them. And she looks down at her phone. She's got a message from Tao. Hi, I miss you. And she writes back, I miss you too. And again, she's not supposed to have her phone on her. Don't get in trouble, Elle. She just put it down on her desk and just left it there out where anybody could see it. I'm a girl. You're going to need to put that away. Okay. This is when we have Charlie going into the art room. And his teacher's coming out saying, is it the secret boyfriend or the straight boy crush? And he just says he's on the rugby team. <laughs> I joined the rugby team. And his teacher says, of course you did. <laughs> oh, God, what it must be like to watch baby gays unfold. It, it, like, it really must be something. Um, But yeah, the fact that they're like, secretly having their time together in here i was like is nobody gonna notice they're both gone at the same time i feel like this is something that everybody would clock i don't know um but charlie sits down and nick asks him are you sure your friends don't mind you having lunch with me and he says nah they can deal with it clearly i need to be here to get uh, to get tips on how to be good at rugby and he says oh is that what this is about and they're smiling at each other and the camera goes under the table and they're holding hands. <laughs> you guys. I'm like holding hands is just like next level. Once you've started holding hands, in my opinion, that's a pretty big deal. Like I think holding hands is a bigger deal than a kiss, to be honest. Like a kiss that can just happen. That can just and then you, one of you decides like, never mind, And it's like, it didn't. Holding hands is like so much more intimate. There's an ongoing decision to keep holding hands as it's happening. Like all of it just feels different to me. Um, and Nick says, it feels nice to be able to ditch my friends for once. All they want to do at lunch is just sit on the field and chuck stuff at people. And he's saying, like, this is before the scene with Tao later. So we were given full warning that that was what his friends got down like. And I did not see it coming still. Uh, Charlie is like, really? And finds it amusing. And I'm just like, ooh, you won't, bruh. Watch out. Um, and Nick says, mainly Harry. My friends are nothing like you. And... All of a sudden, I saw it, you guys. I saw it that what Nick needs is the queer friend group. As much as he needs Charlie, he needs a complete, like, remodel of his social relationships in general. And I don't know why, but something about that I found really, really touching. Like just the concept of it's one thing to just like stay otherwise the same person 
right? But if you are making a major change and you keep the same exact friends, how major is the change really? So I just, I don't know. I hadn't really thought about maybe he would leave his friends behind, which in some ways would be fine because, you know, he's learning about himself and he wants to be with people who are more accepting and understanding and also can relate. But there's also a part of me that's like, he seems to really like playing rugby though. And what if he's suddenly just not friends with anybody on the team anymore? Like that, that sucks to sort of maybe give up on a space being as like friendly toward you as it had been when it's something that you like to do. I don't love that. So but, but, you know, overall, yeah, he needs, he needs new friends. He needs a whole change. Um, and the, the, they just have like a little chat about how he is, he being Charlie, sorry, he's hidden in here a lot, went back when he was being bullied and Nick says, well, when Mr. Ajayi was in here, he was giving me some, uh, really evil eyes. And Charlie says, oh, he may have thought you were Ben. I told him about the Ben making me keep us a secret thing. And Nick looks away really guiltily. And Charlie says, that's, that's not like what we're doing. You're nothing like him. This is completely different. And I think he really seems to mean it. I think he really does. And I agree. As much as one could say they're similar and they they're they're similar in that it's just i'm not i'm not ready they're totally different in the way that each of them sees charlie as a whole person and cares about him like they're they're not at all equal to one another so completely agree but nick is obviously riddled with guilt over this and i think that he sees charlie up, like saying you're not like him as Charlie just not wanting to lose him and so not wanting to like press him or accuse him of anything, but that inside Nick doesn't agree. Like, I don't think he thinks Charlie's lying to his face is what I'm trying to say that Charlie's just saying, Oh, it's not, it's not the, like the same thing at all. When he really thinks it is, I think Nick feels Charlie doesn't want to upset me and he's pretending that this isn't the same thing. But it fucking is the same thing. I'm being just like that asshole. I can't believe I'm doing this to him. Is really, you know, like the whole feeling with Nick continues throughout the episode to be, I can't believe I'm doing this to him. I can't believe I'm doing this to him again. It's so clear how he, like, he can't escape the similarities of what he's asking Charlie to do to what Ben was asking Charlie to do. And he fucking hated Ben and was disgusted with him. So how, you know, like, yeah, if you're some, if you despise somebody because of how they treated a person and then you step back and realize the fucking broad strokes of what you're doing are the same, you can't not feel like a piece of shit. It's just, of course you will. So We have what I'm going to call the least important or least compelling part of this episode, which is the rugby. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a girl who actually really likes watching men play rugby because they are usually big brawny men who are beating each other up, which I enjoy. Often, like in, a, in a, a way that's extremely athletic and impressive to watch. And they are not wearing a lot of padding. So you actually can like see their bodies. And I would like that. Yes, please. So for me, rugby is a personal favorite. It's like rugby and boxing. I just like men fighting. I just like it. I'm oh, sorry. But these are children. So I can't feel that way. And let me tell you guys, when we toss in a team of like fully grown men playing with the children, my feelings were extremely confused and it was not pleasant. I didn't like it because I kept like having to be like, wait, how old is he before I start to go? Yeah, boy. And it was just really tripping me up a lot. But 
fucking Charlie. He's struggling because somebody comes at him. He is supposed to tackle them and he doesn't. And all of the boys are sort of disgusted with him being like, does he even want to play? Why did he join the team? And I really felt for him here because we saw him tackle Nick and he did well. And I was sort of thinking like, oh, good. He can tackle, period. I thought, you know, it didn't even like occur to me. Well, he wants to be touching Nick. So, yeah, he tackled him. It's fine. Uh, and <laughs> Cindy says, we used to have a rugby team that stayed at our hotel every year and they were in their mid twenties and so hot. Oh my God. A whole team. Oh, Cindy, you got me wanting to write like a personal fanfic about working at a hotel with a whole team of rugby players. <sighs> Let me just take a moment. Okay back to the story um so on the field when they're like kind of shit talking him Ch charlie he's like obviously i had thought not only that maybe he was past i'm afraid to tackle but i thought he was past the team talking shit about him it seemed like he had grown so much to be part of things that i wasn't worried about this anymore but then you know, so the the coach comes up to him, uh, a woman coach, by the way, who looks uh, like West Asian, and she says, are you going to be OK for the match next week? And I she's she's not like criticizing him. She's genuinely sort of going, hey, bud, look. And she says, uh, I'll ke I'd keep you on reserve for longer, but Kieran has an unavo unavoidable dentist appointment. The tackling, you've really got to commit to it. They try not to worry about getting hurt and just throw yourself into it. It's all about confidence. And he says, well, it's hard to be confident when they all see me as a stereotypical gay boy who can't do sports. And she says a lot of gay people are good at sports, Charlie. Very firmly. She's not like, you know, reprimanding him. But I'm not sure that that really helps with how they're talking about him or seeing him. Like, she's not wrong, you know, but that's not really addressing the issue. Um, So, I, you guys, it's just, I don't, I don't like any of the moments that we get what I know we kind of have to get. <laughs> like when I come down to it, that's what it is. We have to see people who aren't as friendly toward gay people. We have to see people who don't understand the other person is gay because they haven't come out and are approaching them. We have to see somebody who isn't certain about their sexuality waffling and deciding to go out on a hetero date. Like, we have to, but I don't want it. <laughs> I don't want any of this. I just want my boys making eyes at each other and going secret places to kiss and then making eyes at each other some more. Um, so anyway, he kicks at a cone in a very petulant way. And then he picks up the ball and he looks at it for a moment and we get a montage of him practicing tackling. And it's really funny guys, because he's tackling one of those sort of, I don't know if you would call this a sandbag exactly, but it's one of those like weighted bags that is meant to be around the weight of a person and it's padded so that you can practice your form without hurting yourself. But it like, it feels to me like he is so uh, gentle with it that as thin as he is, I was sort of like, would this actually take anybody down? I know that he took Nick down in that one time, but I don't know. And he really like clearly wants to get this right. Now, granted, that want is deeply seated with, I also don't want to be bullied, but I do appreciate him deciding to put the time in instead of doing what I think would be understandable and going guess we're going to lose the game because of me. And honestly, oh, well, 
because I wouldn't be that mad about that either. Tackling dummy, they're saying. Thank you. I did not know that was a thing. Um, it doesn't look like a dummy. Like, I I believe you guys that that's what it's called. But it, I think dummy and I'm thinking something that's got like, you know, arms and legs and a head. And it's just a big bag. Um, I love, oh my God, you guys. We have Elle walking past some girls who are talking about Darcy and Tara. And one of them is talking about them kissing. Well, some girls just do that. And I was like. Who's going to tell them? (laughs) This reminds me of a post I saw somewhere where a person was talking about like how common being gay actually is or being even bi and how many of us are not like trained to let ourselves think about it. So we don't know. But if there were a chance for us to step back, we'd realize. And a guy in... (laughs) A guy in the comments replied, well, it's not gay if you've never actually had sex with anybody. Just thinking about it isn't gay. And I was like, babe. <laughs> like, I know it's sad and I shouldn't laugh because it is. It's sad. The, the ways that we have to tell ourselves that we're not total freaks. We have to comfort ourselves out of a thing that is true about ourselves because it's not acceptable to a number of people. It's so depressing. But at the same time, the idea of just like, well, all I do is just like watch a ton of gay porn and beat off to men a lot. I don't actually have sex with them, so I'm clearly not gay, okay? Fine. I mean, if you say so, bud, I don't know what to tell you. Um, And the girls, actually, when you think about it, there are 1,200 people at this school, so at least a few of them are going to be lesbians. Maybe you're a lesbian, and you have no idea. And... The other doesn't seem to react badly. They're just talking about it and they're very like chill and I liked it. Also, 1,200 in like just the girls' school? That's that's so many. I really thought this was a smaller school than that. That's a lot. Like, I think my high school, I think we had like maybe 800. I don't even think we had that many. I think we had like 700. And yeah, makes more sense now why you may not have seen certain people. Like I said, when uh, Nick and Charlie first met that they must have seen each other walking around, but they may very well not have noticed one another. Um, so then we go to Elle and she's having lunch with Darcy and Tara And uh, they're talking about how they're hoping it'll die down because evidently everybody is talking about it. And Imogen comes up to Tara and I love Tara getting this look like, oh boy, here we fucking go. Hi, Imogen. What's up? One minute I hear you and Nick are a thing. The next I hear you're kissing some girl at Harry's party. Darcy coming in. Tara literally kisses her girlfriend at a crowded party and people are still asking if she's dating a guy she kissed once when she was 13. And I did really enjoy this. Like, granted, Tara could be bi, but I appreciate that Darcy adds on that she kissed once when she was 13. Just to really emphasize, like, oh my God, can we please move on? You know? Um... And Imogen says, so that was her girlfriend? I'm right here. All right, fine. I was just asking. Just so you know, me and Nick are together. So I just needed to check. And Ella's like, I'm sorry. I am going to need you to pause one moment. You and Nick are together? Mm Mm-hmm. I mean... (laughs) Pretty much. 
Look, we look cute together. Yeah, very cute. Oh, girl. Like, it's really, I don't, I guess it's just my anxiety speaking. But if I didn't know for certain this was going to be a thing, I would never take the risk of like posturing this way publicly, so to speak. Not exactly publicly, but you get what I mean. Like the way she's laying a claim, it's rife with opportunity for her to be humiliated. And it's really taking a risk that I don't think is worthwhile. So you and Nick are definitely not. I'm a lesbian. Okay. And then she sort of stops and like the way that Tara looks away. I'm not like homophobic. I'm an ally. Tara says, congratulations. And Darcy says, we thank you for your service. (laughs) And Imogen just looks like she does not know what to do. And she just like looks down at the table and like without making eye contact, just walks away. (sighs) I'm an ally. Oh, honey. This is the thing. Again, with like Imogen and not being able to hate her. If the word ally had existed when I was in high school, the way that it's used now, I would definitely have been one of those bitches saying this sort of thing. No question. Absolutely none. I would have. I just wouldn't. I wouldn't get. I wouldn't get it. I wouldn't get it for another 20 years. (laughs) So again, I want, I want to hate her, but I just, she's so real. She's such a real character. Like, ah, uh, oh, Imogen. Oh boy. Anyway. Okay. So <laughs> I, I, the look on Elle's face too, because she does not know what's going on regarding Nick. So you could tell she is not looking forward to like getting this all figured out and maybe seeing things blow up in Charlie's face Tao being proved right like the whole thing so okay we have the scene with Tao but I talked about that so then we go to Charlie and Nick jogging around the track and uh, Charlie is saying that he's going to be bringing his friends to the game and Nick says that's nice obviously not sure what to say because he names Tao as part of the group and like clearly they're not friends so what do you do how do you handle that? You know? And, uh, Nick says, don't worry. I didn't tell them. And Charlie says, did I get it right? I can't remember. Anyway, are you, is that okay? Are you sure? And he says, yeah, of course. This is when Harry jogs up behind them and gives, Charlie, like a real slap on the shoulder. We're counting on you, bud. And I was like, oh boy, I know that he like probably means to actually be somewhat supportive here to a point, but also it's meant to be, I got my fucking eye on you and I'm much bigger than you and could probably smash your face. Um, so we see his friends arriving on the sidelines. It's sort of weird because everybody just stands to watch the game They don't go and sit up in the bleachers that are right there. They just like, you know, which I found sort of weird. Once it starts raining, I was like, oh, yeah, because then you're just going to get your ass soaked. But uh, I really was kind of surprised at the way this game, like how incredibly informal it is. But it is like the full length of a game almost. So it feels informal, like you would just play a real quick pickup basketball game, but it's not short like that. So it was a little weird. But anyway, his friends, Al, um, they come up with Tara and Darcy. And I love Darcy wrapping her arm around him and saying, Charlie, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm mainly here to get acquainted with the local gays. But, you know, you and Nick Nelson are looking suspiciously couply. And He's trying to be like, he, we're, we're friends. We're just, he's my friend. This is a, meanwhile, Charlie is like 
leaning against one of the sawhorses, staring intently. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're definitely just friends. Nothing weird happening here at all. Okay. Um, why? Why? Are there, ru- are there rumors or something? And she says, no, it's just my gay intuition. I, I, I promise we're just friends. We're good, totally platonic friends disappointing but okay (laughs) ah darcy how delightful i love her so much then nick's friends arrive much less interesting a group of people let me tell you (laughs) like maybe they're not maybe once you get to know them but uh you know on the exterior i'm not interested so this is when we have these grown men show up and uh, Charlie asks, why is the other team literal adult men? They're a specialist sports school. So this is meant to be like for them to learn from these guys. When I tell you, like the first guy to run out of the locker area, the camera is down around knee level and his thighs is thick. It's nice. I like it. That's all I'm saying. So those dudes, they're uh, black and yellow stripes like bumblebees. It's frankly adorable. Our guys are in two different shades of blue. A lot more boring. And the game gets started in sunshine. Everything is bright and lovely. And we're seeming like, all right, let's, let's show them what we learned, Charlie. I mean... You know, he's been practicing his tackle. I feel like he really tried to get it right. Now he's going to be able to show it off and we'll see him really impress the rest of the team. It doesn't go that way, guys. And I'm not mad. Actually, it would have been pretty easy if it just happened that quickly. But I did think. I did. I just thought, you know. (laughs) I don't know if you guys can see Sam on the camera, but he just like came up to me. And sniffed my armpit and is sitting right here. Oh, he laid down. He's like, Mom, Mom, you should have been done recording. I should have. I'm so sorry. I'm going long. But it doesn't go that way. As I said, we have the rain begin to pour down. St. John's, who's playing them, is like up 30 points to zero. And there comes an opportunity for Charlie to tackle this guy. And he decides to take it. This grown man. He's like, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. So he attempts to. And the dude knocks him off. And there's also a really big puddle, like right where he lands. And there's a sort of implication, though I could not tell if it was true. That, sorry, Sam, what are you biting? I don't like that sound you're making, bud. Get out of there. Come here. Do you guys hear that? He's chomping on something. Hey. <laughs> you want me to be finished, don't you, bud? Hey, what do you got in your mouth? All right, nothing. Ugh, sorry, guys. Dogs, am I right? Um, but the, the implication, because the coach then says, I'm calling it, the, this mud is too dangerous. So I wasn't sure if it was supposed to be that Charlie may have made that tackle if it weren't for the mud, like it made him slide when he wouldn't have otherwise. I thought that's what she was saying, but it may have been just her being like, somebody got hurt. Let's just call it. You guys have creamed us, put us out of our misery, you know? Um, But yeah, he goes down and we have like Nick looking at him and imagining the way that Charlie responded to him saying, can we keep it a secret surrounded by pouring rain and looking super sad. And it's just, I almost wondered, is this going to like motivate him to come out right here on the field in front of everybody? Like, you know, and I, I, I was a little disappointed that it doesn't happen. He just, we cut to Charlie in the infirmary and Nick comes in and sits down next to him and, wipes his face because he's has got a bloody nose and you guys charlie turns to nick and says i'm sorry for being all clingy and annoying i'm making this so awkward 
You wanted to keep this a secret and I am messing it up. I cannot. This is such real shit too. Like we all know this person who they are being absolutely fucking reasonable, but they are so paranoid about being a burden or people not really liking them or that they're being too needy or demanding and they absolutely take on this like guilt that is not theirs and 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 the imagining that it's something he's doing that's like causing rumors when literally nobody's talking about this charlie it was just darcy but she like planted it in his head that if he was being obvious then everybody else must be thinking it too and it just like it killed me you guys i hated it so much i was so sad i hated this for him Ugh. And Nick says, I'm the one who should be apologizing. And their faces are quite close, but they're not kissing or anything. And Isaac comes in and you see him stop dead because he knows what the fuck he just walked in on. Like, they're not making out, but there's an energy. And you guys know the energy when you walk in on it. It's simply there's no way around it. I have to I, what I think it is, is the pheromones are so loud, you know. I say loud. I don't know how else to describe it when it's a smell strong, but you walk in and your body responds to like the pheromones because you're going, Oh, how do I know? So without a doubt that here are two people who really wish they were fucking right now. You know what I'm saying? Um, so Isaac's like, um, here are some antiseptic wipes I was told to bring. Sorry for interrupting. And he drops him and leaves and Nick gets up because obviously that was a pretty close call. He says, I'd better go. And Charlie says, okay, Isaac won't say anything. And you guys, again, Charlie has taken it upon himself that this is his fault. So the fact that it was his friend that interrupted them. It makes it worse. It makes him feel like I'm the one ruining the secret. And when he says Isaac won't tell anyone, Nick is responding shamefaced with okay because he is so like upset with himself for n for not being willing to come out. But what it looks like to poor Charlie is I'm so ashamed because he saw me and now I just have to worry about another person knowing about it. And I just, oh, you guys, it killed me. It really did. Like, I wish, I wish that we would hear each other and communicate better, but it's so hard to believe that somebody is telling you the truth about how they're feeling. I, you know what I'm saying? I really hate this. Um, but yeah, the, the, he walks out of there. Charlie is left feeling like Nick is mad at him. Like you can tell the body language. It's really tough. Um, and we have a brief scene of Tao and L talking about the fact that Charlie's not going to give up on Nick, the fact that uh, her friends seem really cool and that he's happy for her making friends. And then we have Imogen asking Charlie out and him taking a very long pause before she says, I was thinking that maybe we could go out somewhere together like a date. And them going, go on, Nick, go on. And he just says, okay, yeah. And up top, he is being observed. He does not realize this by Tao and L, who give each other a look as everybody walks away. And they realize like, oh, we are going to have some fucking damage control to do because this is not good. And that's the way the episode ended. So I don't think anybody's going to blame me. But I didn't want to rewatch it. So that's that. 
I gotta go. <sighs> Toodaloo, motherfuckers. <gasps> oh my god, Owen just texted that he's taking Pippin on a walk. I wonder if that's long enough for me to watch the episode. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. Okay. Toodaloo, motherfuckers.